Lord and Savior. But most people that say that, that's not what they mean. They just mean I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Because I'm open and all for being saved from anything. But my Lord? Uh, doesn't Lord mean Master? So therefore, if I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord, I need to be obeying Him. Yeah, nah, no, no thank you. And so, okay, what's the alternative? Okay, let me believe that nothing blew up. And all came from nothing by nothing without a cause. Well, like I've said many times, I simply don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So, we debunked, by God's grace, the Big Bang. No evidence whatsoever. We got science themselves saying we got nothing. Then, oh, by the way, I did want to touch on this briefly. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of this, but have any of you heard of New Earth Evolutionists? By show of hands, anybody ever heard of New Earth Evolutionists? Okay. There's not many, but they're, they're out there. There is a middle ground between evolution and creation that has been fabricated. But there, excuse me, there are those who believe that yes, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no Big Bang, fine, there's a creator, but evolution still exists. In other words, God did create everything we see around us, but he didn't do it in no six days. It took millions and millions and millions and millions of years for God's creation to evolve. There are a lot of people that believe this. They're called New Earth Evolutionists. Well, if you just do a little studying, this is not that difficult to debunk. But just for you to know, a few questions that I personally have asked New Earth Evolutionists, they got no answer for it. But, for example, if you believe that God created all, but not in six days, the way the Bible says, but through millions and millions of years, we've got everything he created. Check this out. The Bible says that plants were created on the third day. We can all test that, right? Just Genesis chapter 1. Plants were created on the third day. And the sun was created on the fourth day. This is the Bible. If these days are millions of years instead of a literal 24-hour period, then how can the plants survive for these millions of years when they need sunlight to survive? These are questions that cannot be answered. If plants were created but then through millions of years evolved, how did they survive without the sun? Unless it was an actual 24-hour period, the way the Bible says. Also, plants need insects to exist for things such as pollination, but the insects, the insects were not created until the sixth day. So how could all these plants survive for even more millions of years, supposedly, without sunlight, without insects, without pollination? <laughs> It makes no sense unless they were literal 24 hours, the way the Bible describes. And by the way, this is the major stumper of them all. Adam was created on day six, lived through day seven. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 5-5 that Adam died at 930 years of age. So if this day were literally thousands or millions of years, this would make absolutely no sense regarding Adam's age at death. So, just a little something to also debunk the New Earth evolutionist theory. But anyways, so we've debunked by God's grace the Big Bang. And I also would love to hope and pray that last week by God's grace, I proved not only debunking the Big Bang, but I proved creation by giving you scientific evidence evidence on the Cambrian explosion. I don't know how many of you guys were not here last week, 
please go to YouTube and look up last week's message because I broke down something that science, the government, does not want you to know about. It is so interesting that all the science books, all the biology books, they've got maybe one or two sentences on the Cambrian explosion, but then right back to the Darwinian theories. But the Cambrian explosion is actual science. Remember that we discovered, or, or we went through that science, in order for it to be qualified and considered as science, needs to be what? Observable, testable, repeatable. Something that the Big Bang cannot do in any way, shape, or form. But the Cambrian explosion, know that it's real because the fossils are real. Look what Dr. John Wells says here, just to recap and refresh. The Cambrian explosion is the geological sudden and abrupt appearance of most of the major groups of animals that have ever existed on Earth. This is a dramatic event in the history of life because it documents on fossil record the appearance of all the major complex species and phyla, which are animals, to have come into existence all at about the same time. From nothing, they go on to say, we have almost everything, and practically overnight. The explosion is real, they concur, because the fossils are real. Explaining it, however, is controversial. This phenomenon remains mysterious. Nobody really understands how this happens. How this happened. Well, of course, if you don't want to believe in a God, yeah, that's going to stump anybody. But the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, there is actual proof out there on fossil record called the Cambrian Explosion that practically overnight, out of nowhere, you've got living proof, fossils, that every animal under the sun all of a sudden came into being like this. They call it the Cambrian Explosion. We call it creation. We were right in the middle of the design argument on giving the three arguments for the existence of a theistic God. So now we enter into scientific brilliance that the Bible shares way before man discovered it, part three. Still in the middle of the design argument. Folks, can we all agree, tell me, can we all agree that without billions and billions of years, evolution simply doesn't exist. You need millions and millions and billions of years for evolution to be real. Time is evolution's best friend. Well, you'll recall that last week I told you, I debunked the Big Bang, I proved on fossil record creation, but now, today, as we conclude, to bring life and validity to the Bible, the only true Word of God, I'm going to prove to you that what most people on the planet believe, oh, we've been here millions and millions and billions of years, could not be further from the truth. And again, I'm not going to tell you like they tell you, uh, you just need faith because there's absolutely no evidence. I'm going to give you science what is testable, observable, and repeatable to prove that the Bible is right. So check this out. Following the chronology of the Bible, beginning with creation, according to the Bible, please know, the earth and life on it is approximately 6,000 years old. That's it. That's it. Millions and millions and billions, 6,000, according to the Bible. Now, of course, most people would laugh at you and say, come on, millions and millions of years ago, the dinosaurs, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, let's take a look at science. For example, check this out. Dust on the moon. In 1969, scientists estimated about one inch of moon dust for every 10,000 years of history. Through their scientific research, they came to the conclusion that when they got to the moon, they were gonna find approximately one inch of moon dust for every 10,000 years. So if the earth was 20,000 years old, 
how many inches would there be? Two. If the earth was 30,000 years old, how many inches should there be? Three. Three. Okay. So this was what they came to a scientific conclusion. Well, they concluded, since we're supposedly millions and millions of years old, they concluded that on their first trip to the moon, they would encounter at the very least 182 feet of moon dust. Well, guess what? When they got there, what did they actually find? What is observable, testable, repeatable, real science? One third of an inch of moon dust. Now, if they scientifically came to the conclusion that they should find one inch of moon dust for every 10,000 years, but they only found a third, I'm sorry, three quarters, three quarters of an inch estimates about how long? Approximately 6,000 years. So what was actually found on the moon did not back up the millions and millions and millions and billions of years. It backed up biblical time. Amen. Now, does anybody here know what a supernova is? A supernova is when a star explodes in space. Well, it has been found because they've actually found the evidence of supernova remnants. In other words, what's left over of an explosion. A star explodes, but they find little particles floating around. They say, ah, this is the remnant of a supernova. What's left over of the explosion. Check this out. Astronomers have observed that approximately every 30 years, a star explodes. So a supernova occurs approximately every 30 years. With the Earth being only 1 billion years old, okay, supposing that it was only 1 billion years old, they would have, they would have found well over 33 million supernova remnants. In other words, there should have been at least 33 million explosions in space if we are at least 1 billion years old. However, the actual recorded number, and please look this up if you think I'm making this up, Google it. The actual recorded number of current observed supernova remnants, 205. There is only proof, tangible, observable, repeatable evidence in space of only 205 explosions. Now they explode how many years? Every 30. So if we want to do this in terms of time, there's been 205 explosions. All you got to do is 205 times 30. What does that equal? Huh, 6,150. The evidence of what floats in space does not scream millions and millions of years. It screams biblical time. No? No, okay. Maybe you'll get excited in the next one's coming up. You guys remember this story, which many deem should be between Pinocchio and Cinderella. According to the book of Genesis, the worldwide flood took place roughly around 2800 BC. That's approximately 4,800 years ago. Get that, okay? According to the Bible, according to Genesis, the worldwide flood took place approximately 4,800 years ago. Also, according to Genesis, the only survivors were Noah, his three sons, and their wives. For a total of how many people? Eight. Now, check this out. <clears throat> the population of man on this planet... If we were to start, if we were to have gone back to the beginning and start with one couple, a man and a woman, starting with just one couple, if the earth was only 41,000 years old, by applying modern growth rates, disease, war, famine, etc., the world population should today be 20 to the 89th power. Folks, there's not enough space in the universe to fit that. 
we would have approximately 150,000 people per square inch. If we would have started with two people 41,000 years ago. However, applying the same growth rate, if we started with eight people, and having the starting time coincide with biblical time, about 4,800 years ago, mathematically, we should currently have 7.9 billion people on earth today. What is the current world population today? 7,951,630,000 as of June 2022. Again, biblical time. Do you see how we are destroying this whole millions and millions and millions of years by real science? What is truly observable, teachable, repeatable? Anybody here heard of the Sahara Desert? The Sahara Desert, let me show you what's interesting about it. The Sahara Desert has a prevailing wind pattern that is always flowing from the east to the west. Now, this is a problem because the hot air form, I'm sorry, the hot air from the desert blows to the west, killing the trees and plant life constantly, creating more desert as it goes. It's called desertification. The Sahara Desert is growing approximately four miles a year. It's perpetual growth. Now, this is science. They have actually studied and researched this, that with the hot winds blowing from the east to the west, to, to the west killing off trees and plant life, consistently creating more and more desert uh, land, desertification, the deserts are constantly growing. They never stop. The Sahara Desert grows about four miles per year. Now, recent studies indicate that the Sahara Desert is approximately 4,000 years old. Now, if the Sahara Desert has been growing perpetually non-stop forever, why, when you look at the mileage and how big it is, why does the calculation say only 4,000 years? Um, how long ago was the worldwide flood according to the Bible? 4,800 years ago. How old is the Sahara Desert, one of the biggest, oldest deserts in the world? 4,000 years. Why aren't there older or bigger deserts on earth? If we've been here millions and millions of years, there should be much bigger deserts on this planet. Why is the, busy, the biggest desert in the world only approximately 4,000 years old? Because of biblical time. That's why. Trees. Did you guys know that the oldest known tree, which is recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records, is located in the White Mountains in Southern California, right here. You know how, it's, it's called the Bristol Cone Pine Tree. You know how old, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, you know how old the oldest tree is? 4,700 years old. When did the Bible say the worldwide flood happened? 4,800 years ago. What a coincidence. Again, proving biblical time. Amen. The history of man. All written history of man. And even the earliest markings of man, known as hieroglyphics. All date back to only about approximately 5,000 years. Now, isn't that interesting? Absolutely no recording older than 5,000 years. You would think if man has been on this planet for millions and millions of years, there should be markings, hieroglyphics on stone or that date further back, but the oldest thing they find is about 5,000 years, which would match again biblical time. Now, <clears throat> you guys remember that I shared this with you guys last week? Darwin's tree of life. Darwin says, you know his theory, we all came from that one-celled amoeba. Everything came from one cell. 
And from that one cell, we all started continuing to evolve and evolve and grow. This is what he teaches. Well, <clears throat> did you guys know that scientifically, a cell <clears throat> is made up of molecules? Molecules are made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The average cell contains a hundred trillion atoms. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because, beloved, supposing that Darwin was right on that one, okay? Suppose that everything originated from this one single-celled organism, this one-celled amoeba. Why is it that Darwin was like, be, 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 to questions like this? Where did the six billion atoms needed to make up the simplest cell come from? How did these six billion atoms all know to organize themselves into about 42 million different molecules, all performing extremely vital and specific functions in order to keep the cell alive? When and how did the 135 terabytes of specific information, binary code, end up embedded into the DNA of that cell? And why and how did these DNA molecules not only store an astronomical amount of coded information, but how did they also know when to replicate specific sections of themselves while containing specific coded instruction in order to produce the exact specific proteins needed at just the right specific time? How do you explain that? They can't. There goes the famous, I don't know. Oh, but we all came from this one cell amoeba. Folks, what is a cell? I know that Dr. Grafalz here could probably give a lecture on what a cell is, but the average person, I would venture to say, does not know what a cell really is. You see, we didn't know in Darwin's day what a cell actually was. Darwin didn't know what a cell really is. It's only recently that we have been able to break open the black box of the cell and know what it actually is and what it actually contains. Now, when we open up a cell, <laughs> what we see is a city virtually. You open up a cell and you are looking at a huge factory, like a city, well-organized run city and factory. And inside each and every one, you see these tiny, I don't know if you can see it, let me get the, my little laser here. Inside all of these microscopic tiny little atoms that are in the cell, you have a world of astonishing machinery and complexity beyond what the mind can fathom. And part of this machinery and complexity is a language. A language called a genome. Well, you know, to, to, to explain this better, let me give you this illustration. How many of you here like uh, alphabet cereal? Anybody here try alphabet cereal? Okay, imagine, let's suppose that you're a teenager and your name is Travis, okay? You're a teenager, your name is Travis, you come down one morning, you want to have your alphabet cereal, and when you get down to the table and you're ready to have your alphabet cereal, you notice something in front of your plate. What do you notice? You find this on the table. Travis, take out the trash! Now what are you going to think? The, the, the cat knocked over the box? And this just magically spelled that? You know that a message like that is coming from an intelligent design. A messenger. Mom. Or dad. <clears throat> You're not going to assume that that just happened. Why? Because based 
on all your prior knowledge and experience, that message had to come from a mind. How about this? You're walking down the beach and you see this. Tracy loves Billy. Oh. What, do the crabs do that? Do the waves do that with enough time? Again, based on all the prior knowledge and experience, you know that a message like that had to have a mind that made that message. Well, what's my point? If these messages, simple little messages like this, had to come from a mind, we all agree with that, a little tiny message like this had to come from a mind, well then, where does a message like this come from? Where does this message found in DNA come from? Because you guys are aware, DNA is an encrypted message inside your body. You see, the message in a DNA cell is equivalent to a message like take out the garbage or Tracy loves Billy, only it's a little longer. In fact, it's the longest word ever discovered in every single one of your 40 trillion cells. The word is 3.5 billion letters long. Each DNA cell has a message. You open up that cell and find that city, each one of those little atoms has a message inside it. And the message has been scientifically discovered through microscope to see that the message contains 3.5 billion letters. And all these letters are in a specific, strategic, precise, perfect order. You look inside the cell, it's not like an explosion when in the letters are everywhere. Every single letter, every single genome is right precisely where it should be, how it should be to give that exact precise message. Folks, who put them in that order? Where there is a message, there must be a messenger. Have you ever wondered how much information your body contains? If one, one DNA cell that is naked to the human eye has a message of over 3.5 billion letters, you know how much information one human body contains? The amount of information in one human body, if put in books, would fill up the Grand Canyon and not just once, not just once, four times, 16 times. No, folks, if every single information inside your body was to be put into a book, it could fit into the Grand Canyon 50 times. And all that information is strategically placed the way it is for you to exist. One of those letters gets reversed, you no longer exist. Really? This is you at 11 weeks in the womb. You know, in fact, let, let, let's go back even earlier. Let, let, let's go back to when your mother and father got together. Well, you guys have never had this talk before? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Well, I do see some children in the crowd, so I'll, I'll be discreet. When your mother and your father got together, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg. And then your father sent out the entire population of the United States. Three million, no, 300 million soldiers. Cells. Cells. Toward your mother's egg. And there was a race. And you won! Don't let anybody tell you you're not special. 
You beat out over 300 million other people. I mean, you've blown away anything Michael Phelps has ever done. When your soldier and your egg came together, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt. Yet at that point, it already contained half of the genetic information that makes you, you. Your mother's egg was smaller than a period at the end of a sentence in an average book. And it contained the other half of the genetic information that makes you, you. A new 100% genetic human being was created. And did you know that you have not received one more genetic information since that point? Till, till right now. You have not received one more letter since that time. And I want you to know that from conception, from the time that the soldier got together with that egg, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that keep a two-year-old from adulthood. You think this has any implications on the abortion issues? Of course it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why are we going to kill the unborn child? Genetically, they're the same. And from conception, folks, an astonishing construction project began. Cells began to be multiplied inside you at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began to multiply at 10, 100,000 cells per second. Well, for most of you anyway. You didn't get the joke, okay. Some cells became brain cells. Some became human heart cells. Some became lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. And by the way, that perpetual ongoing construction project that started at conception continues on to this very day. You just made four million new red blood cells. You just made another Four million new red blood cells. You just made another four million new... Knock it off! How are you doing that? Are you guys standing there? Wait, 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 don't talk to me. I'm, I'm forming cells. Hold on. How does your body automatically know how to do that? How? <laughs> The same way that your lungs know how to automatically expand to receive and be filled with air. The same way that your heart knows how to beat. It's because it's being done by a designer who created and sustains the universe and its nature. Including the laws of nature themselves. Where do the laws come from? From law givers. But, there's one in every crowd. I don't know how many of you guys know who this is. <clears throat> in 1954, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Dr. George Wald, said the following. This is a scientist, okay? And not just a scientist, a Nobel Prize winning scientist said the following. When it comes, capture this, okay? When it comes to the origin of life on this earth, there are only two possibilities. One is a spot, but by the way, I just gotta stop right here. I am not a doctor, a biologist, or a scientist. I've just done some studying, and I'm open to being corrected if wrong, but I've got a doctor in the house. 
Uh, Dr. Grafal, as far as you know, with all your study, has everything biological and scientific that I've shared been accurate? Yes. Thank you. Not say so. I know you would. <laughs> Check this out. Nobel Prize winning scientist, Dr. George Wall, says the following. When it comes to the origin of life on this earth, there are only two possibilities. One is spontaneous generation, which is evolution. The other is an act of supernatural create. Uh, I'm sorry. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third way. Now look what this scientist says. Spontaneous generation, which is evolution was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That just leaves us with only one other possibility, that life came from an act of creation by God. But now listen to the renowned Nobel Prize winning scientist mind. But I cannot accept that philosophy because, and here's his scientific reason why, I don't want to believe in God. Therefore, I willfully choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. That life arose spontaneously by chance. Do you catch this? This is a Nobel Prize winning scientist saying I am aware that science has debunked evolution. But I got to keep on believing in it. Even though I know scientifically it makes no sense. Because see, if I don't do that, then I got to believe in God. And I don't want to do that. So because I don't want to do that, I willfully choose to believe in what has scientifically been proven to be impossible. And this is a Nobel Prize winner? <sighs> but catch these words. What were his exact, his exact words? I willfully choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Why does that strike a chord with me? Because when I read this, I remembered a Bible text. What did God say men would do in the last days? 2 Peter 3, 5. Check this out. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water. Creation, folks. Look at the same verse in a different version. They will say this because they want to forget that long ago the heavens and the earth were made at God's command. God said thousands of years ago, there will come a time where men will willfully forget. In other words, they will willfully choose to forget that I created everything. And what did this scientist say? I willfully choose because I don't want to believe in God. Folks, 2 Peter 3, 5 was the prediction of evolution. That scientist had a choice and so do you. The question is, which route are you going to go? Well, this brings us in closing to the last section of the three arguments that I would give to prove the existence of atheistic God. And that's morality. Which brings us to reason number five. The final reason that I would give to prove the validity of the Bible. And that is the Bible's powerful ability to change lives. Amen. The Bible has shown a power to change lives unlike any other book on the face of the earth. <clears throat> but now, before we finish dissecting this, you got to ask, here's the million dollar question. All right, pastor. You've spent the last four or five weeks proving that the Bible is, in fact, the only 
inspired word of God. If the Bible is such a great and awesome book, if it is in fact legit and real and we can prove it scientifically, historically, in every way, shape and form, if the Bible is such an awesome, great book, why is the Bible in most homes sitting in a corner somewhere with so much dust on it that you could write the words, read me with your finger? If the Bible is such an awesome, powerful book, why are we not rushing more to read it? I'll tell you why. I started giving you the answer about two weeks ago. You remember when I read you a statement by this cosmologist, Dr. Alexander Valinkin, when he said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. In other words, giving more fuel to the Big Bang. No, there is no escape. They, talking about humanity and science, we have to face what? The problem of a cosmic beginning. If the Bible is so great and so powerful and so awesome, why are people not rushing more to read it? Why is the proof that there was a beginning, thus a beginner, why is that a problem? I'll tell you why, folks. Because you see, this book is made up of standards. And today, nobody wants to live by standards. Don't tell me how to live. I'll live the way I want to live. It's my life. <laughs> like if they were the ones in charge of making their heart beat. Every time I hear people say, it's my life. Don't tell me how to live. It's my life. No, it's not. It is not your life, and I can prove it. Because you can be dead tomorrow, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you were in complete and total charge of what happens to your body, then maybe you'd have a leg to stand on. But knowing that each and every one of us, beginning with me, can in the next 10 seconds die of a stroke, and there's nothing we could do about it, it's because it's not our life. It is in charge of the creator of it. <laughs> Folks, let me, let me let you in on a little secret, okay? There are no real atheists. People believe in God, okay? They believe there's a God out there. It's written in our hearts, according to the Word of God. That's why there's such a thing called a guilty conscience. That's why people feel guilty, even atheists. Because there is a God, and they know it. But you see, they, <laughs> we can't escape truth, so you know what we do? We suppress it. We suppress it to go our own way. To do our own thing, what we want to do. Why? Because we don't believe that it's true? <laughs> no, because we don't want it to be true. There's a difference. There's a huge difference between I don't believe that it's true and I really don't want it to be true because it's inconvenient to me. People hate having to live by God's standards. They want to be God. They want to be that dictate how they live. You know, <laughs> the number one question you should ask an atheist, I've done this before, and like I said, it, it almost never fails. Of course, not in a church, but having been in a public setting, I have asked the question, okay, let, let, let me just stop for a moment. Let me ask an atheist the question. Who's a full-fledged atheist out here? Somebody will raise their hand. You, sir, let me ask you a question. And this, by the way, is a question you should ask any non-believer. If Christianity were true, and you knew it as a fact, would you become a Christian? They say, no! 
Wait, 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 hold on. If Christianity were true, and there was proof that there was a God, you wouldn't become a Christian? No! Hold on, wait, hold on. I thought that as an atheist, you were a beacon of reason. And that it's all about... How does that make sense? You see, folks, the problem is not up here. It's in here. That's where the problem is. You see, most of these people are not on a truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. They don't want to do or believe whatever they think is not going to make them happy. Like, like Pascal once said, I don't know if you guys know Pascal. He said, people almost invertibly arrive at their beliefs, not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. Atheists have admitted to me that the reason why they are not Christians is because they don't like the moral constraints of God. You see, the elephant in the room is not evidence. The elephant in the room is morality and accountability. They don't want it. Like I said, they want to be God. They don't want there to be a God that they have to surrender to, submit to. That's why so many people are angry with God. You know, a very famous atheist, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, Christopher Hitchens. He's long since passed now. British guy. Had a British accent, so it sounded even more like he knew what he was talking about. If you heard any of his oral speeches or read his book, man, you would just come to one conclusion. Man, this brother is mad at God. When I, when I took a look at one of Hitchinson's books, I said, man, there is a perfect line that would be the perfect theme to his book. He's an atheist. His perfect, you can, you can wrap up his book in one sentence. There is no God, and I hate him. He was mad at God, like a lot of people are mad at God. But you see, if you're mad, see a lot of people look at, how can there even be a God? Look, look, look at all the injustice going on in the world. Look what happened in Texas. Look what happened, all these kids dying. How can there be a God with all this injustice? Look, if you believe in injustice, then that means that justice also exists. Injustice cannot exist without justice. And if justice exists, God exists. The fact that we don't understand, our finite minds don't understand his will sometimes does not make him non-existent. I saw this little post and I thought, wow, I got to show this to the church. Because it makes perfect sense. Atheists don't hate fairies, leprechauns or unicorns because they don't exist. It is impossible to hate something that doesn't exist. Atheists hate God because he does exist. But no, we want to forget truth, right? Well, you can do that temporarily. You can have temporary satisfaction by following error. But long term, there's only one way to find ultimate peace and happiness, and that is going straight, straight through the truth. Because if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And by the way, who is the one that said, I am the truth? Jesus. Jesus. That is why Jesus is our only true source of happiness. But we find ourselves many times discouraged. Because okay, we want to give it a chance. Okay, we'll accept the Bible. We'll accept God. 
But then we realize that, man, living life as a Christian is so hard. When you have this kind of discouragement, look at me, look at my life, I'm so far from being the ideal Christian. Please let me share with you Romans 7, 14 through 16 and verses 22 to 25, one of my favorite texts of all time. Who was one of the greatest men in the New Testament besides Jesus Christ? Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament, para empezar. Look what he says in Luke, I'm sorry, in Romans 7, 14, 16, 22, and 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. Look what he says. For what I will to do, meaning what I would like to do, that I don't practice, I don't do. But what I hate, what in my mind, I'd like to say, no, I don't want nothing to do with that. That I do. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Can any of you resonate with that? Can any of you relate to that? Man, what I know I should do, what I know clearly is right and I should do, I end up not doing it. And what I pr propose in my mind, I got to do this. I know that I, I want to do it. I end up not doing it. But what I want to stay away from, oh, that's bad. I know I shouldn't do that. That's what I end up doing. You see, Paul continues on saying, I see a law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is the only one that can give us the power to do the things that we don't want to do and not do the things we want to stay away from. Because carnally, we can't do it alone. Man, this gave me so much hope. I thought, man, if Apostle Paul, the greatest man of the New Testament outside of Jesus Christ, was battling, and I want you to know, do a little research as when Paul wrote this. He didn't write this as a newbie, okay? He didn't write this for only being Paul a few days. He already had been Paul for many, many years. And yet, look at the battles he was going through. But you know what made Apostle Paul so great? It was not his perfect sinless life. What made Apostle Paul so great is that no matter how many times he fell, he got back up and said, Lord, please keep on helping me. Amen. He would stumble in sin, but would get up and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me. Help me. Help me. And he ended up, the Bible says, crossing that finish line. And God said to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not because you lived such a perfect sinless life. But because no matter how much the enemy attacked you, you didn't give up. And you kept on reaching out to me, saying, take my hand. You see, folks, in the Bible, we find the greatest story ever told. The story about a cross. And you see, folks, as I've mentioned, the birth of Christ was what brought God to man. But it was the cross that brought man to God. The teachings of Christ showed us how much he knew. But the cross showed us how much he cared. The miracles of Christ caused us to believe in him. But it was the cross that proved that he first believed in us. The philosophies of Christ were able to take men out of the darkness, but it was the cross to take the darkness out of men. The compassion of Christ was enough to keep us out of hell, but it took the cross to be able to get us into heaven. Amen. There have been many, 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 many self-help books that have tried to bring and have brought many times men out of the darkness. But only the Bible has been able to take the darkness out of man. Amen. And so I close with these two texts. Jeremiah 33.3 3, 
The Bible says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You see, I'd love to think, beloved, that by the grace of God, for the last five weeks, I have been able to requete, requete, prove that the Bible is, in fact, the only, solely, divinely inspired Word of God. Amen. And now that we know that, see, we, we, we've just begun. This is just the beginning. This is just scratching the surface. Because the Bible says, call unto me, and I'm going to show you great and mighty things that you never knew. But see, before doing that, I had to prove its validity. I had to prove to you that when we open up the Bible, we are, in fact, opening up the Word of God. Now, after today, after we seal up the intro, I told you guys, next Sabbath is a special Sabbath. We're going to take a little break from the series. We've got a special Sabbath. But the Sabbath after that, we're going to make Jeremiah 33, 3 come to life. Because we're going to begin to scrutinize the gems that the Bible has for us. And now, I can trust that all of you will know and have that blessed assurance that when I read you a text from the Bible, you're not doubting, ah, well, that could be any book. No, you will know that it is coming from God. Amen. John 5, 39, our closing text. The Bible says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Bible says, search me, search the scriptures, and in them you will find Jesus Christ, the only one who is the truth and who will be able to get us all to the destiny that we're aiming for, and that's heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and close this morning's service with our closing hymn.